This paid podcast is produced by Slate Studios and Century 21 Real Estate. All uses of trademarks or brands are not meant to convey sponsorship or affiliation of this podcast. From Slate Studios and Century 21 Real Estate, this is The Relentless, a podcast about looking at sales differently. What if? What if I thought outside the box? What if it was more of a celebration with our clients than work? In every episode, we're pulling back the curtain with thought leaders across industries and talking about how they embrace change, overcome hurdles, and stay relentless. I'm Dr. Julie Gerner. I've spent over a decade studying the behaviors of the ultra-successful and have used those insights to empower business leaders in finance, technology, and real estate. Have you ever poured time and effort into a deal or client that just didn't pan out? Or maybe you failed to successfully pitch to investors. When we hear no, It's easy to get to a place of self-doubt and insecurity, especially if you are your business. And that's what we're exploring in today's episode. We'll talk about ways to bounce back from rejection, and we'll discover that what feels like failure is in fact the pivotal shift we need to get our careers to that next level. In this episode, we're doing something new. Later on, we'll talk to a Century 21 affiliate to find out how real estate agents deal with rejection. But first, we'll hear from someone who puts himself out there on a regular basis, whether it's on stage or at an audition. When I walk into that room, there's a bunch of people line up to judge, not me, but how I do that role. You have to separate your identity from your product. Your product is how you do this. Your identity is who you are. Problem a lot of people in my line of work face is if you don't like what I do, you don't like me. That's the first thing you got to separate. You're there to do a job. That's Adam Ferrara. He's an award-winning stand-up comedian and actor. He hosted the BBC automotive show Top Gear US and starred in the hit shows Rescue Me and Nurse Jackie. His 2018 comedy album titled Unconditional climbed to number two on the Billboard charts. Currently, he's working on a new podcast called 30 Minutes I'll Never Get Back. And that's not even the half of it. Yeah, it's impressive. You should see the list of things I didn't get. It's even longer. (laughs) And one of the things that made that list was a TV show opportunity. We shoot the pilot and you wait. You know, it's it's, it's a lot like 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 death row. Did the governor call? You know, you wait. (laughs) We have a life. And we didn't get picked up. Didn't get picked up. So I go, my career is over. It's just it's death. I didn't get out of bed for three days. I don't think I particularly smelled that good. And I just would just shut everything off. Didn't pick up the phone. Finally crawled out of my hole. After about three days, the phone was ringing. I picked it up, and it was Alex Rocco. He he goes, kid, I put my retirement in your hands, and you screwed it up. (laughs) And he said, don't let them control your happiness. I'm on the golf course. I'm teeing off. Click. And he hung up. That resonated in my head. Don't let them control your happiness. It's a powerful message. Yeah. And he he goes, this is what show business is. So at, at that, that was the beginning of knowing that there's a way to, not, not, not more control, but to interpret to happiness. So it, it was a way of understanding that I don't have to be defined from the outside in. Because if you're looking for outcome to define you, or if you're looking for outcome to bring you happiness, you're screwed. So when you look at kind of the mindset you have to have to kind of grow or see these as opportunities. Mm-hmm. You know, how do you get into that space where you're able to say, look, I might get rejected. It may be a no. I may walk away not getting the thing that I want, but I'm going to learn to see this as an opportunity rather than... Get better in what you do. That's what you can do. Build your product. Build your machine. How can I, get be- how can I use this as rehearsal to get better for the next thing? I got called in for The Sopranos 10 times. 10. 10. At least 10. And it was always 5 o'clock at rush hour. Take the subway to Queens because that's when they saw people at 5 o'clock, which is rush hour. And you got to get on the N and the R, which stands for never and rarely <laughs> because they barely show up and you're packed in there like a crush of humanity. Ugh. So now you're nervous all day when you get called in because you're just that's just the way uh, the, the moment before performance. I'm a mess mumbling to myself and you're on the New York City subway. And the nice thing is nobody cares, right. but you're all nervous. You sign in and there's a line of guys that look just like you. Any one of them can do the parts. Then you go in, you do the part, you leave. Now you're kicking yourself. Oh, I should have done this. I should have done that. If you have a list of what's successful and what you wanted to accomplish, and just pick three little things. You go home, you check your list. You go, all right, I did that. 
Ten times they called me back. And I, 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 because they kept pitching to me. They liked me. They were trying to find a place. So look at the, even though I didn't get the result I wanted, I got, I got success by being called back again. So that was a victory. So even, even though you don't get that one, you're going to learn something in that sales call. You're going to learn something in that meeting that you can use somewhere else. Ten friggin' times I went back. By the eighth time I went, what's wrong now? What is wrong now? <laughs> I'm not talking with my hands enough? Is that it? How more Italian you want me to do? You want, you want me to lose a war? You want me to cook your pot of sauce? You know? So I made them laugh, and they kept calling me back. I never got a part. Never. Huh. But I got a call for Nurse Jackie. Same studio. Fantastic. Same time to read with Edie Falco. The body was conditioned to taking that trip at rush hour, to dealing with those nerves, to walking in that room, to be confident enough in that room because I've been there before. And right. I did it before. So it was familiar territory. Boom. Did, I read with Edie first time, got the job. I did two years on the show. Collect the information. That's all you can do. And then one day, all this stuff is going to line up. My father used to say, life's a friggin' slot machine. Keep playing. One day, the wheels are going to line up and you get a jackpot. And then you know what happens after you get a jackpot? You play again. True enough. So what do you tell people, though, who say, you know, they're a bit impatient, they just kind of want that overnight success? Oh, you're the one that's impatient. What do you think? You're the only one? Right. I go from zero to homicide in three seconds. I have no patience. <laughs> and so how are you able to have the patience to look, build a career like you have? Well, a lot of kicking and screaming. You know, at the point I'm at now is I look at what I can get out of that opportunity to move me forward. The world's going to catch up to you eventually. But I'm at the point in my life where I'm shifting from trying to get something to trying to be something. Everyone says, that, oh, oh, the best things in life uh, have come to me when I, when I stop looking, when I stop trying. Right. Yeah. That, oh, I don't care. It's not, yeah. That went right to, I'll kill you. You know, that's, <laughs> so getting past that anger is, that's not caring. Not needing is where I had to get to. I'm still not there. But I can get a look at when I do need and when I do want, how it constricts the machine, the body specifically. Because actors, it's, it's, you know, here it's the instrument. It's true. Right. You can't let, if you look at anger and you look at disappointment and you look at your reaction to rejection, you're going to physically take a minute and just assess your body. You, your jaw clenches, your eyes narrow, and, and everything is crunched together. When something's crunched together, all the molecules are together, there's no space. But that's it. You've got to have room for uncertainty to be in there. And I do not like uncertainty. So what I like, though, is that when you say when you need something, when you feel that kind of need, that it constricts you. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a really valuable lesson, no matter what industry you're in, because if you're focused so sharply on that need, you can't do what you need to do to succeed. No, because you're, you're only focused on one kind of result uh, uh, in that moment. And if you don't get that result, you're not going to see what else is there for you. My father did kitchens and bathrooms. He worked with his hands. He, he designed this stuff. He worked with his hands. But 90% of his success was him selling his idea of how he can make these people's house what they want. And you get very animated when you do it. And I would watch him. I would watch him sell. And he was, it was a performance. It was, it was a communication. And in my job in stand-up, the first thing you do when I learned very early when you go on stage, the first thing you do is not to get them to laugh. It's to get them to trust you. Once they trust you, you can do anything you want with them. And there's a responsibility that comes with that, that comes later. You know, you're, you're, they're, they're putting their, their, their emotional care in your, in your hands for an hour. So you don't want to shock them. You don't want to, but, but get them to trust you. Any kind of sales call, any kind of, any kind of interaction with another human being, there's an unspoken, nonverbal communication. And if you go into it with an agenda, it is read as untrustworthy because you're looking for something from them rather than showing them something for them. So how do you begin to establish a relationship with someone quickly? I mean, you have an audience you're dealing with. It's like someone walking into like a listing presentation or anything. Mm -hmm. You have an audience there. You don't know them very well. Mm -hmm. You don't know them at all sometimes. And you walk in. How do you establish a rapport with these individuals or and a feeling within them that they can trust what you're about to say or do? There's a great definition, and please excuse me, I forgot where I read it. But okay. the definition of a gentleman is someone that makes somebody else feel comfortable in their presence. If I'm going to a new city I've never been to, I write a joke about the city. I've noticed this about you guys. This is how it's different from me. I call it the stranger in the strange land moment. And that's what I do. And it communicates unspokenly. I've taken the time to get to know you. I've taken the time to... to I'm, I'm grateful to be here. This is what I've taken away from it. And, uh, and then I put my personality in the third beat. 
So there's three beats of it. So I'll just give you an example. I was in uh, I was in Portland for the first time, and I remember it's very nice to be here. You're you're very you're very nice people. I was over at the Dutch Brothers Coffee together. Very good coffee. You seem very polite, but every one of you are ready to snap, aren't you? And they. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's like I, that's just what hit me in that moment. Um, tell a truth. Uh, there's a great my acting coach Stephen Book uh, has a great book called The Actor Takes a Meeting, and it's it's about the sales the the, the business part of our business. And when you walk into any any meeting, tell the truth about something in the room. I'm on a new show now called uh, Why Women Kill on CBS All Access. Uh, and in the room, when you go in to read and test for something, there, there, was, a, there was a little picture of the Venus de Milo okay. in the corner. So that, that's a truth. That's there. I don't want anything from it. It just happens to be there. So in order to calm my nerves, I said, you know what? I always thought Ernest Hemingway Farewell to Arms was about her. <laughs> and that was a good way to like it kind of got a laugh it's something about in the room i didn't want anything from them it's right. just an observation of oh he is funny he, i'm laughing and when you laugh it's the opposite of constriction of anger it's open it's vulnerable it's free you're in a nice space to watch my performance and assess right do you have any particular habits or rituals or things that you rely on to really put you in a good headspace before going on an audition, before going out there and meeting with people? Yeah, it's, it organize, organize your thoughts, have realistic expectations, monitor your execution, build the monkey bars before you go in so you can just swing, baby. I do this too when I come home. Too, is there's, there's, it, in acting, it's called the moment before. You just don't walk into a scene and start a scene. The scene's already going. And when the cameras are on, the audience is picking it up midlife, midstream. You're in the state of becoming, which is very enchanting for someone because, oh, something's going on. I need to catch up. So right. you're in the state of becoming. So when you walk into a sales call, you're already, your momentum's already going. You're on this train. You're ready to go. And if you're not in a place where you're ready to do something, take that time. It's even, even when I get angry when I come home, um, Oh, before I go into my house, if I'm if I'm in an angry mood or I'm cranky or I'm upset about something, mm-hmm. I'll sit in the car before I go in because I don't. I'm not bringing this crap home. That's, <laughs> that's the fort, that's the fortress of solitude. And my wife is in there, and she's she's put up with enough. Yeah. So I I'll sit in the car. Sometimes I actually get out of the car, go in the passenger seat, and yell at me in the driver's seat. Seriously? Yeah, just to get rid of it because I it just it's it's toxic. It's it's the disappointment and rejection will kill you if you let it in. So put, give yourself a barrier where no further, this goes no further. Marcus Aurelius said, I'm going to butcher this, but the, the reaction to anger is more destructive than the causes that arouse it in us. So, yeah, you're going to get pissed off. Look, life ain't easy. <laughs> and you're going to get pissed off. But, but have a place where when I come home, like, yeah, all right, this aggravation will be here tomorrow. I ain't bringing it in. What's so funny is that you go to something that actually is this old therapy technique uh, called the empty chair technique. It's a just stalt. Is that gestalt? Yeah, it's yeah. a gestalt thing. And they have people, you know, pretend this is your mother sitting here and what do you want to say? Yeah. And, but if you have yourself sitting there, it's it's fascinating because you actually put yourself in that seat and then yell at yourself. Yeah. And it's my father's voice coming out of my head, too. <laughs> so have you approached like how you deal with, you know, possibility of rejection or that type of performance yeah. differently from like when you're just starting out until now, you know, how have you evolved in that way? You look at your moment of power and what is in your control and what do you want out of it? First thing you have to do is get what is your definition of success? Because if you don't have that, you don't know if you're doing any good. Right. You know, you're looking for them to tell you. The hell with them. They don't care. How are you going to do it? So when I go into auditions, when I first started out, I'm like, what do I need out of this? First of all, I need to know that moment of power. I figured that out. Uh, then I need to know how I can do my best and what do I want to communicate in that moment. Acting is all choices. You make a choice and you, you present that choice. And then 90% of it's out of your control. One of the things that we ask everyone who comes onto the podcast mm-hmm. is how do you define relentless? Getting up off the floor and doing it again. Relentless? For me? Getting out of bed in the morning. Oh, I don't greet the day like, <laughs> hello world! No, the yeah. day comes to get me like, get up. <laughs> You're not sleeping. Get up. I got to get through that mental state where it's Monday morning. My homework isn't done and the school bus is outside. I mean, that's, yeah. It drags You're you already up. late. Yeah, I got to get through that. <laughs> that's good. So I just keep getting up over and over again, regardless of, uh, of how you yeah, feel. It's, uh, my, again, I go back to my dad. He's going, your life is going to happen when you're sleeping. He goes, keep, just keep showing up. If nothing else, you keep showing up. Just that annoy the universe so much, they're going to go, here, 
you know? I remember when I was playing tennis, my coach used to tell me that even if you could get every ball back and it isn't pretty and it isn't great, but if you can get every ball back, no one can beat that person. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways it seems like as long as you keep getting up and you keep doing it over and over again, who's going to beat you? Yeah. Well, the other thing about tennis is, too, once you hit the ball over the net, you're in uncertainty. That's true you got too. no idea what's going to happen until it starts coming back at you. True. Well, I, I mean, you re- you try to read the situation, right? You mm-hmm. try to read their feet. That's why people wrong foot others or other things. But, yeah, you try to think about the wind or yeah. what they normally do or patterns that normally happen. Yeah. But absolutely, I mean, you have to try to read it. And I think that as a comedian, mm-hmm. certainly as someone who goes on auditions, I bet that you have a real skill around reading the room. Most comics have their spidey sense about reading the room. And the interesting thing about it is it's usually used to diffuse tension. So you can read a room, you can read people. It's, it's a sixth sense that we have. And in, in dramatic acting, it's something I had to overcome because... Uh, How so? I, I had to get past that barrier of making everyone feel comfortable in laughter because that mm. was always my goal. And I, I did an episode of Criminal Minds where I had to play a, a father of an abducted kid and I got to break down and cry in an FBI office. All right, 8.30 in the morning, first shot of the day. This yeah. is what I got to do, right? So, okay, so I'm sitting there. I, I got emotionally got to where I needed to get to. I did the scene, broke down in tears. It was great. It was coming back and putting myself back together. That's the difficult part. Mm. Um, and then when I came home, you know, I was a twitchy mess for a while because opening up that, what's in this box, Pandora? <laughs> you know, so, and my wife just pretty much looked at me and went, hey, Hamlet, knock it off, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't do Shakespeare. You did an episode of Criminal Minds. You get it together. That's your machine. That's. But once that door is open, and I will tell you one thing I learned from perceived failure or disappointment is is sit in it. See what's there for you. Hmm. Write down three things while you're pissed off and de- depressed and what does it mean to you, right? Just write them down. Don't try to analyze. Just get them down. Put it on. I, I use index cards. Put it on a three by five card. Just write those three things down. Put it in your pocket. Come back a couple days later read about it and see if it still pertains. And if it does, see what you can learn from it. That's, that, that's what you got from that moment. Every moment you're in has something there for you. See what the hell it is. Thanks so much for being on the show, Adam. It was a real pleasure to speak with you. I enjoy talking to you too. Everyone, please be relentless and pace yourself because it's exhausting. It was intriguing hearing how a seasoned performer like Adam Ferrara deals with rejection. And I wondered how a real estate agent handles it. So I called up a Century 21 affiliate in Utah. This is Mike Stengel with Century 21. How are you? Hi, Mike. It's great to speak with you. Great to speak with you, too. We're out in uh, Vernal, Utah. The weather here is great, and uh, it's been a good day. For people listening who might not know what Utah looks like, what does it look like out the window there? Oh, the Una Basin's beautiful with the vast lands, plenty of places to recreate, whether it's hunting, fishing, camping. We are really the destination spot of Utah. The way Mike talks about Utah, you would think he grew up there. But actually, he's been an agent there for just six years. When I came into the basin, the thing I was up against was, I'm not local. I don't have these connections. I don't have family. And and now, six years later, I have clients that have told me, you know, I have family members that are real estate agents. And I have went with you because of my conversations. We, We felt comfortable what you do. And when you come into an area where you're not known, you have to leverage your things that you do know. And you have to get to know your clients. His ability to adapt and learn from rejections really struck me, particularly when it came to selling his first home. It was a tough sale, and uh, it, was, it wasn't in the best shape. Not asking enough questions or not giving enough advice or not knowing what to ask made a huge impact on my ability to either sell it or not sell the home. And unfortunately, at the time, I didn't sell it because I didn't have the experience. However, I learned from that, and I think that from every transaction, you learn something different. So I got Mike up to speed on our talk with Adam. He talked about getting to that place mentally where you stop trying to get something and start trying to be something as a way of moving past rejection, about moving ahead. And I'm wondering what you feel about that, how you relate to that. Oh, well, you know, once you move past rejection by learning how to handle it, and that comes with experience over time, uh, you learn that 
you need to, you need to put the client first. And so we can get straight to the, you know, cut straight to the to the decision for them, give them the answer they need, give them the contract they need, help them with the deadlines or their due diligence or inspections or whatever it may be. There's a lot that goes into it. And I know that sometimes in the real estate industry, we do it over and over again. And honestly, in real estate, you can become complacent in what you're doing. And you can have that time where you ha- you close that big deal and you're thinking to yourself, hey, I've got this. I'm good for another three, four months. But if you don't know why you're doing it, and you say, well, I reached my why. Well, let's get something else. What's the other reason why that you're doing it? Is it for the client? Are you putting the client first? Or are you looking for what your financial goals are for the year? Or are you giving back enough to the community? I've learned that my greatest joy in this business is just doing something and not expecting anything in return. In the service that we provide, the things that we do outside of the business in our community. So you have a very personal investment in your community and your clients, and you are your own brand to some extent as an agent. So what tactics do you use to not take rejection personally when it happens? Oh, I just smile at rejection. Um, it's just another opportunity to ask the question. And and honestly, if the rejection is no, and you know, it's okay. Not, not every client is the right fit. When I sit down with a client, um, I, I've had this discussion with several clients before in the past, and this is usually right after we they say, we're going to go with you. And I, and I simply just say, you know, during this process, I'm interviewing you as well. I need to know that not only are, am I going to be the right fit for you, but you're going to be the right fit for me. Um, you can avoid pitfalls and avoid a lot of problems in real estate by simply understanding what the needs of the client are. And if those, if the price is overpriced, that's okay. My response to the client is the market's just not ready for your price, but it will be maybe in six months, maybe in a year, sometimes maybe five years, but it will eventually get there. It seems as though understanding your audience and really being able to read the room is an incredible skill to bring to the table. When Adam performs in a new city he's never been to, he writes a joke about that city. Do you relate to looking for connections with people in that way? Oh, absolutely. If you don't know who you're talking to and you're not, uh, if you're talking to a farmer, the last thing you're doing is talking about yourself. Um, If you're talking to somebody that is, um, uh, let's say if you talk to somebody in business, it's get straight to the point. Uh, last night, I was with a client until about 10.30 at night. Most of the time, was just talking about himself, his passions, what he's done, finding the connections. And if you can connect quickly with your client and find similarities, things that relate, found out he's from San Diego. That's where I'm from. That's where I was raised. And if you can find a connection, a personal connection with the individual, the faster you do that, the higher likelihood that you will have a connection and relationship with that client, irrespective of getting the deal or anything else. And they will remember that. And not only that, but they may not choose you today, but they'll choose you tomorrow or next month or next year. And and you'll you'll have that relationship. Or you walk in down the street and you're like, how you doing? It's good to see you again. Relationships pay dividends over time. So, Mike, you're incredibly successful in real estate. You take your hits. You've probably had some rejections. You've had successes. I'm wondering how you decompress, refocus, and kind of relax so that you're able to bring your best self forward. Oh, the recharge. (laughs) Um, You know, the recharge for me, honestly, um, and and I know this this may not be the right answer, but but it is. I absolutely love what I do, but I also love projects. I love working on our house and we bought a home that was a little bit of a fixer upper uh, and we've been working that over the last six years, my wife and I. So for me, it's tinkering. It's the the projects. It's it's actually, it's quite literally the honeydew list. And I find that the more time that I spend with my family, that's my recharge. I think that early in my career, my focus was always uh, work. And I think that I've grown to the point where I, I'm looking at it and I just can't wait to see the family. I can't wait to be home, to do the projects, uh, to start our new adventures. When you're in real estate, you have to know the reasons why you're doing it. If you don't have a why, then you need to find it. My business doubled last year simply because I knew my reason why. Fantastic. Thank you so much for speaking with us, Mike. It's been a real pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you, Julie. Appreciate it. Hey, listeners. Are you in a job with the flexibility and independence to make your own schedule? It can feel really liberating, right? But there's a flip side. For a lot of us, the lines between work and life can become really blurred and stressful. Finding that balance requires some unique approaches. What questions and solutions do you have about crushing it at work and at home with a non-traditional schedule? We want to hear from you. Here's how you can send us a message. 
Our email address is century21pod at slate.com. Or tweet your question with the hashtag century21pod, and we may use your question in an upcoming episode. The Relentless is produced by Slate Studios and Century 21 Real Estate. I'm Dr. Julie Gurner. Thanks so much for listening, and please join us next time. Copyright Century 21 Real Estate, LLC. All rights reserved. Century 21 Real Estate LLC fully supports the principles of the Fair Housing Act and the Equal Opportunity Act. Each office is independently owned and operated. Nothing herein is intended to create an employment relationship. This material may contain suggestions and best practices that you may use at your discretion. The opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individuals featured and not necessarily of Century 21 Real Estate.